In this series, we're trying to build a 1-bit vacuum tube computer loosely based around the Motorola MC14500. We've made enough changes that I've started dubbing it the UE14500, UE for uh, Usagi Electric. Uh, so far, we've built quite a lot. We've built about half of the microprocessor, but because we have around 90 tubes trying to power up all at once, we're running into pretty serious inrush current problems. And that's because my B plus voltage is only 24 volts. And I chose this voltage because, well, I wanted to see if we could do any interesting things with vacuum tubes at low voltages, but also 24 volts means that I can run four vacuum tube heaters in series. So a lot of the computer is built around this concept of four tube modules. But what this means is that the 24 volt rail is trying to power up all of the vacuum tube heaters at once. And when those heaters are cold, their resistance is very, very low. That's why whenever we kick the power supply on, we see a massive spike to up over 10 amps, and then it almost immediately comes back down to less than five amps. And so what we wanna do is we wanna mitigate that initial spike. And that's what our inrush current is. And so there's two things that we have to tackle when building our soft start, which is kind of what I've ended up dubbing it. And the first thing that we wanna take care of is, well, we wanna limit the amount of current that we can supply initially. And then we wanna have a time delay. So we want to limit that current for a set amount of time. And then after that delay, we wanna flip over to having the B plus, the 24 volts supplied directly. So those are the two problems that we need to tackle today. I have an idea about how to do it. So let's hop over to the bench and uh, get started. And so for the soft start aspect of it, this is essentially what I'm thinking, which is uh, exceedingly simple. Uh, essentially we have on the far left here, we have our input that's going to go to our B plus. This is going to be the 24 volts for our uh, computer. And then we have uh, two wires that lead up to this. And one wire is essentially just a straight shot from our 24 volt supply. And the other wire has a resistor in it. And if we make this resistor sufficiently low enough, like five ohms or two ohms, that'll limit the amount of current that can flow into our B plus initially until the heaters get a little bit of heat in them and we can switch over to the main wire. And that is a job that is perfectly suited for a relay. And relays are really simple. Essentially we have a coil and when we run power into this coil, it energizes the coil, which creates a magnetic field, which pulls the contacts over to the other side. So we have a common, we have a normally closed and a normally open. So we'll have our plus 24 volts directly from our power supply coming into the common. And when we first turn the system on, the coil will not be energized. And so that'll flow through our current limiting resistor here into B plus. And so after a set amount of time, we can energize the coil here. The common pin will flip over to the normally open and we'll have a direct connection from our 24 volt power supply directly to our B plus. So I'm really pretty happy with this. It's really simple, should be easy to build. And I have a couple relays that are actually out of a car, a couple 12 volt automotive relays that I wanna use for this. And so that brings us to the next question. How are we going to trigger the coil on those relays? Everything we've done up to now has been built with vacuum tubes. So I would like to continue that theme, but uh, the coil on these relays requires quite a lot of current and so, uh, maybe we can use a cathode follower, but you know, I don't even think one cathode follower is gonna be enough. So maybe let's give uh, four cathode followers a try. Uh, everything we've built so far has used one tube and one tube only, and that is the 6AU6 sharp cutoff pentode. These are not meant to deliver current, but as a cathode follower, the only thing impeding current from our supply through our coil is going to be the internal resistance of the tube. And if we have four tubes hooked up in parallel like this, well, that should bring the internal resistance of those tubes down quite a lot, which should give us more current. So maybe this can work, I'm not really sure, uh, but there's certainly one way to find out. And that's just to pull out the breadboard and give this a test. All right, so we've got our four cathode followers hooked up in parallel right here on the left. All four of these are six AU6s, and this should provide a decent amount of current. 
Now coming off of those cathode followers, we've got the white wire going into our coil. And then the black wire comes all the way back over here to our negative, so our coil has a proper ground. Now I've got a little button here that should test it properly, but you guys may not be able to hear the relay when it kicks off. So I've also set up uh, six volts coming into the common and then coming out of the normally open pin, which is what this red jumper is here, all the way over to this little green LED that's stuffed right here in the middle. Now, you'll notice that there is a fifth tube over here on the right, but we're going to ignore that one for right now. We'll come back to it here in a second. So if everything works correctly, when I push this button, the relay should kick off and the LED should kick on. So let's give that a shot. <laughs> yeah, no, that, uh, that didn't work at all. And uh, honestly, that's really not that surprising. These relays need a massive amount of current, comparatively, because uh, these... 6AU6s can't give that much current, even when set up as a cathode follower, even when four of them are in parallel. But we have this one tube on the right here, so let's uh, disconnect our coil wire to our relay from the cathode followers and hook it up to this single tube on the right here. So let's push the button on it and see what happens. Yeah, there we go, the relay kicked off, our little green LED kicked on. Now the, uh, the button doesn't do anything anymore, so in order to turn it back off, I have to disconnect it, but there we go. Well, this is a 2D21 Thyrotron, and they work quite a lot different from a standard vacuum tube. So let's take a look at how this tube works and how we're going to use it, because using a Thyrotron in this situation makes way more sense than using a bunch of cathode followers. So our four cathode followers didn't work, and that's really not that surprising. A relay requires a lot of current, and even as cathode followers, the 6AU6 just can't move enough electrons. But we saw that on the right side of the breadboard, we had a 2D21 thyrotron. And uh, this was how we had that thyrotron set up, and it's really incredibly simple. We essentially have uh, 24 volts coming into the plate, and we were using two 100 ohm resistors to give us essentially 50 ohms, which we needed to help bring the voltage levels in line with what the relay was expecting, so we don't burn up our relay. And that's because the relay is a 12 volt automotive relay, but I'm running 24 volts up here. But why would I not just run uh, 12 volts directly through this? And well, that's because the Thyrotron actually has a voltage drop across it. Now, the way a Thyrotron works is that instead of the tube being in a vacuum, it's filled with a gas. The Thyrotron will not conduct at all until the gas within the tube itself has enough current trying to flow through it that it ionizes. And when it ionizes, it creates a stream of plasma that essentially connects the plate to the cathode. And this plasma is a fantastic conductor, so we can move a lot more current. But there is a voltage drop across this thyrotron, even with that plasma in there. And it says it's about a nine volt voltage drop. So 24 volts minus uh, nine volts puts us at about 15 volts. We wanna get that down to 12 volts for our relay. So we run about a 50 ohm resistor on the plate here, and that seems to bring everything right into line. Now, one other unique thing that you may have noticed was that once the Thyrotron is energized, we can't turn it off. And that's because as soon as the plasma is created connecting the plate to the cathode, the grid gets encased in positive ions. And so this essentially completely disables the grid. So the only way to de-energize a Thyrotron is to cut the flow of electrons. So we either disconnect the relay or we disconnect B+. Now using Thyrotrons to power relays is not an idea that I came up with. <laughs> As a matter of fact, IBM actually used this exact tube, the 2D21, as relay drivers on their computers as well. So we're using the right tool for the job here. All right, so we know how to drive our relay and we know how to set the relay up so we can get our soft start action going on. So now we need to tackle how to do the time delay. And actually we can totally achieve the time delay by just using the heaters of the Thyrotrons themselves. And so this is how I'm going to build the soft start portion for our computer. Now I'm going to do a soft start for both the negative 12 rail and the plus 24 rail. 
so we're going to need two thyrotrons. And you can see we've got our two relays down here on the bottom. So we have 24 volts coming into the common pin of this relay on the right, and we have minus 12 volts coming into the common pin of this relay on the left. Now, one interesting thing about these thyrotrons that you'll notice is that the grid is actually just tied directly to 24 volts. Well, that seems a little interesting. That means that as soon as uh, power is applied, the thyrotron will start conducting, right? Well, not quiet. If we look at the bottom of the thyrotrons here, you can see that I've actually drawn in the heaters for the thyrotrons. And since the 2D21 uses six volt heaters, I'm running these two heaters in series and powering them off of the minus 12 volt rail. So when I flip the switch on, we do get plus 24 volts coming into the plate and we do get the grid trying to essentially energize the thyrotron, but it can't happen yet because the cathode isn't warm. So we have our negative 12 volts running through our heaters here and it takes about 10 seconds for those heaters to get fully warm and for the cathode to be warm enough to conduct. And so during that 10 seconds, while these heaters are warming up, our 24 volts and our minus 12 volts are going through our current limiting resistors to B plus and B minus. As soon as the cathode gets warm enough, because the grid is pulled high, the gas inside the tube then ionizes, the thyrotrons start to conduct, which energizes our relays down here and directly connecting our power to our B plus or our B minus. So there we go, that's how we're going to build our soft start using a, a couple of thyrotrons that I had laying around and some automotive relays that I found in the garage. Uh, and there was probably a better way to do this if I were willing to buy more parts, uh, but I sure do love using stuff that I already have. And so <laughs> that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use stuff that we already have. So this should be fairly easy to build, but even if I build it, I don't have space for it right now because the piece of wood that the computer is sitting on is already totally full. So uh, we need to do a little bit of woodworking as well. So let's do a little bit of woodworking and then we'll take a look at the soft start and see how well it works. All right, here we go, and it, it looks awesome mounted to this backboard. Uh, before I just had it sitting on that plank of wood and things could kind of slide around and move around. Now everything is very rigidly mounted uh, with these awesome little M3 standoffs and then Allen key bolts on top. And uh, it's just so solid. Everything is held in place perfectly. Uh, up top here we can see the soft start uh, boards. These turned out beautifully. I am really happy with these. Even though the uh, giant plastic relays do look a little incongruous. I might change those out with some different relays uh, if I can find ones that I like. But for now these are going to work just fine. And you can see our giant power resistors here next to them. These are 100 watt 5 ohms. Uh, I chose 5 ohms just kind of out of the blue. I don't really know how that's going to work. We might have to go down to like say 2 or 3 ohms. Uh, but for now this will be a great way to test it. And I put some banana plugs right here at the top for 24 volts ground and minus 12 volts. And then you can see our two thyrotrons right here in the center. And the whole thing looks amazing. So let's go ahead and plug it into our power supply here. We've got uh, 24 volts there, ground there, and then minus 12 volts there. And you may notice that I have put the connector boards, which I have 
along the sides here, I put these on even though I don't have the boards that go below them. And that's because I actually wanted to test some of the functionality out of what we've built so far. And I got kind of tired of uh, plugging jumpers into the exposed pins here into a breadboard. So I just made up this uh, little diagnosis board that slots right into here on some exposed pins that I have sticking out sideways. Uh, so that way I can kind of see what's going on. Now this board has 20 LEDs on it. The 16 on the right here are the uh, instruction that are coming through. So we have a four bit instruction that breaks out into 16 individual signals. And then the four on the left are our kind of input enable control that we're going to see over here. And then I made one more board with some toggle switches on it and some buttons. And this board plugs in right here. Uh, and this board has four switches for the uh, instruction. So we can set our instruction here. We have one switch for the data. We have three push buttons here for clock one, clock two, and then our clock in. And the clock in one isn't actually being used yet. That's actually for parts that we haven't built yet. So uh, right now only clock one and clock two will work. All right, so we've got everything set up. So let's flip the switch and see what happens. All right, I can see that we're drawing just about an amp uh, and the Thyvertrons are starting to warm up. Oh, I heard the relays kick off. We had a uh, fairly large spike, but now we have 24 volts going into everything. So as the tubes warm up, we should see these LEDs on the bottom right here do interesting things. All right, so I couldn't be happier with how the soft start worked. It worked exactly as I imagined. The only thing that needs a little more work is that our power resistors up there need to come down a bit in value. So I think I need to come down to about two ohms as opposed to five ohms to uh, help mitigate that spike once the relays kick over. Other than that, man, everything seems to be working well. And this is the first time that we powered up the instruction register and decoder with our interconnect board here. So that is 88 tubes powering up all at once, which is awesome. <laughs> But if you remember in the previous episode, we built a, an exclusive war unit here, but I didn't actually test this exclusive war unit out because, uh, well, it was dependent on having the instruction register here. And well, now the instruction register is here and we've got some uh, LEDs here for debugging so that we can see what's going on. So let's, uh, let's give that a shot. The first thing we need to do is we need to store one in our input enable register, and that's going to be instruction one, zero, one, zero. We want to set our data to one. We'll push the clock, push the second clock. There we go. I can see our little VFD illuminated here. So we've got a one stored in our input enable register. And then we saw uh, we have two lights illuminating over here, and this is going to be uh, coming out of the exclusive war, and this is going to be our input enable uh, data that's coming out. So this is actually the data that's going to the rest of the computer and it wasn't illuminated until we stored a one in our input enable register. So if I turn the data off, both of these should turn off. Yeah, and if I turn the data on, both of those turn on. But if we remember the point of the exclusive or is to invert the data whenever we're doing a subtraction operation. So our subtraction operation is 0, 0, 1, 1. Uh, and so we'll hit the clock, store that one in. Okay, and now we can see that our data output is off and our exclusive or output is on. So our exclusive or output now is going to be the inverse of whatever our data is. So if I turn the data to one, yeah, we can see that the data LED came on and the exclusive or LED went off. So we've got the beginnings of getting our ALU to actually do arithmetic. How cool is that? I could not be happier with the way that this is shaping up. I'm super excited now that it's actually mounted on a board properly with proper standoffs. So I'm having a ton of fun building this thing up. I'm having even more fun now that we've actually got a little bit of functionality into it and I can test it out with my debug board here. And so I am really excited about the next few episodes and how we're going to finish this processor off because we've got pretty much exactly half of it finished now. So this has been an awesome journey and the journey is going to continue. And I hope you guys come along with me. But in the meantime, thank you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next episode.